Hey, it's John and Mike for DashDudes.com, and we're tasting bad beer yet again. This is uh, Mike the Mad Scientist. Now that uh, these COVID days <laughs> have given him extra time. Yeah, I got to... nothing else to do. <laughs> Might as well ruin some perfectly good beer. Yeah, he's uh, been in his laboratory trying to figure out how he can replicate off flavors for beer um, for us to taste on camera and really just to torture me, to be honest. So we have two beers here in front of us. Yep. One is not doctored, and this one is doctored. doctored. It looks a little bit different. The, the head is definitely a different color. Yeah, don't let the color or the clarity uh, throw you off from the taste with my eyes. I can't help it. Yep. I'm the, I'm, so I'm going to taste these beers, try to figure out what the off flavor may be. I did review like the list of typical off flavors and beers. Yep. I wrote down some fun ones. I keep going back to butyric acid because that's just baby puke. I'll see if I can get some butyric ugh, acid. I actually do not want that. But there's some other fun ones like, you know, that uh, bring banana to the party, some cheese to the party. So maybe we'll, we'll have some of that. Oh. There's always diacetyl. But um, I'm going to taste these and you talk about like... So this base beer is... Give me um, a hint too. So, okay, so this base beer is um, the British bitter. Okay. The best bitter. Um, the redemption bitter. Just wanted to try and, uh, you know, mix up the base beer a little bit. And to show, you know, that these flavors coming out in different types of beer rather than just sticking with like the lightest style of beer all the time and see how these things interact with different types of beer. So um, in this example, um, so this one um, was freshly doctored before, right before it came out. Uh, it's been spiked with something. And um, I spent most of the afternoon doing some alchemy and trying to concoct a way of generating this <laughs> off flavor without having to go all the way back to brewing from scratch. Mm. Um, so this off flavor is normally created um, on the hot side, pre-hot side really. Um, and this off flavor is one that is probably referred to, in my experience, this off flavor is referred to very frequently yeah. and is discussed quite a bit, yet I have never seen it happen. And I've never heard of anybody having it actually happen hmm. with any degree of regularity, let alone actually have it happen. Um, so, um, and so I also tell you this, even though this is a flavor, it's in the off flavor book, this, this one is really more um, an experience. I really chalk this more into the mouthfeel side of it than a flavor per yeah. se, because the this off flavor really doesn't have a flavor. It's more of an effect. Yeah, yeah. So um, I can see it right on your face. Yeah. Let, so, me, let me give it a try to see. Uh, but it, it's not, it might, I have two guesses. Oh, it's there. Now I know what it is, but. Yeah. So like, but I think we've had diacetyl in, in, in beers. Yeah. I, and I wouldn't try to do diastole in a British bitter unless yes. I had done it right on the fermentation Trying, side. Yeah, yeah. So this is to me like this is DMS, right? Nope. No, no. Nope. Okay. Then I don't. It is definitely like it's coating my whole mouth, uh -huh. and I don't know. And what does it do to your mouth? What are you experiencing? You're doing it. Yeah, it's, You're, it's, you are it's, doing it's it. It's drying it out. Yeah, and I. I yep. I, <laughs> the A word. The A word? Astringency. Astringency. Okay, but... Mm. So, like, tannic astringency. See, that was what I felt. So, uh, the metallic beer, I felt. So, like where does... Where do, the, where do the brewing tomes tell us astringency comes from in your beer? <laughs> well, if you, uh, you know... Um, if you squeeze the bag, yeah. If you squeeze the bag, <laughs> squeeze the bag of all your right, brains. Right. I think, yeah. You know, so it's a, it's a, it's derived from the husks. Yeah. And more, more importantly, now you, you and I, would have a really hard time making this happen because we are batch spargers. But the real place where astringency could become an issue is in fly sparging, and more specifically, when you're fly sparging, they say you need to make sure that the pH of your runnings stays below five, six, five, eight. Mm. So as the pH creeps up, you know, if you think about having a mash at pH five, two, five, four, and if you just have untreated sparge water, which is normally gonna be around pH seven, probably closer to pH six, five, because it's warm, 
that is above the range. And so when your pH test creeping up above six and you've really stripped all the sugars and stuff, if you over sparge with a basic solution, now six, six pH of six isn't necessarily basic, basic. but it's more basic than five two. It's, it's relative. It has nothing to do with being seven or whatever, right? So that's when you start pulling tannins from the grain husks. So how did I get yeah, tannins yeah. from grain husks? Yeah. So what I didn't want to do is create a <laughs> spike that had sweetness to it, yeah. right? Because then that would really throw you off. You'd be like, oh, this is under fermented or something, right? So what I did is I took um, a cup, a, a, a heaping cup of rice hulls, okay? And I took four cups of water that I added, a, that were, I checked the pH on and they, it was a, just under seven. And then I added half a teaspoon of baking soda, which drove the pH up to eight. Hmm. Okay. Then I put the rice hulls in there and I heated it up until not boiling, but like 170 degrees. So like really sparge water temperature. And I stirred it and I let it sit and I let it sit and I let it sit. Um, eventually by tasting it, it was minimally astringent, huh. minimally astringent. So I had to cheat a little bit and I added a couple tea bags to this to because if you oversteep tea yes. in hot water it will get really astringent so if you've ever soaked a tea bag for too long and you drink that that is, that is astringency so if you you don't even have to do this you don't have to waste any beer to figure out what astringency tastes like so now that you taste that and it's in the back of your mouth you realize it's like on the front of your tongue it's on the roof of your mouth it's a drying puckering thing yeah. but without the acidic reaction of like how an, how an acid makes you pucker, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so the interesting thing about this is that for all of the advice given about watching don't over sparge and stuff like that, I found this extremely hard to generate. Um, I did try it with a little bit of actually barley malt, thinking maybe those husks would be different than rice hulls. Um, and I still couldn't get it to happen. Mm. I still couldn't really get it to, I mean, I think the only way to, for me to try to do it would be to use like a, set up a mini mash tun and just drain the snot out of it to try to like really strip away everything and then get those tannins to come out. But overall though, the experience is there and this is what astringency would, would pick up like in a beer. I've never experienced this in a beer before in any homebrew beer I've ever had. Certainly no commercial beer I've ever had. No. And commercial brewers are, are most of, they're doing fly sparging, um, but they're, you know, they're cutting their sparge off at like two degrees Play-Doh, things like that to make sure they don't over sparge. Um, so, um, so this is cloudy because if you take tea and you really extract it with hot water and then you let it sit, as it cools off, all the polyphenols that you've extracted, which look this way by via heat, as it cools, they look this way, and then they start refracting light and give you cloudiness. Huh. So, wow. um, uh, as the day went on, that solution got cloudier and cloudier, just because the stuff is cooling off, but it stays astringent. So. Yes, Jeez. yeah, I have to agree. I've never had anything like this. <laughs> this is less off-putting than the last one. True. True. The, the other one, I mean, stuck with me for a good 20 minutes. Now, the funny thing is about this level of astringency, if you were doing this in a American IPA, you, you may never find it because it's almost reminiscent of that pithy yes. what, uh, American citra, citrus hop thing, right? It, at least it would be buried under there. So you have no idea whether you're getting it or not. You True. Know? So, um, I, I don't know. So it's the funny thing about all of this... Um, handed down wisdom about these off flavors. Um, one, I'm finding it really hard to figure out how to even make them happen on purpose, let alone what would the impact be. In a beer like this, you can taste it because I've made it happen. But if you accidentally over sparge, depending on the style of beer you're making, you probably would miss it. And mm -hmm. a, a, anything other than say a, a Munich Helles and lighter, you would probably miss it. You probably mm -hmm. wouldn't even find it. Gotcha. Yeah. So the, the, I guess the tip is don't try too hard <laughs> to yeah, yeah. produce astringency yeah. in your beer. I would say that with this one, it's not something that I would actively worry about. People mm. talk about acidifying your sparge water a little bit. If you want to drop one mil of lactic acid in your sparge water, great. But unlikely you're going to have a problem. Interesting. In my experience. But yeah. I'm not a fly sparger, so I don't know. Right, right. Batch spargers don't have these types of worries. Batch spargers unite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll start a little club on the side. Yeah. All right, well, hopefully you learned something from this. Uh, this doesn't seem to be 
something that typically happens. Um, I, my follow up, like, so you've seen judge judges sheet saying like this assurgency don't sparge too much. No, my point is I don't think I've ever well once a long time ago in that batch was like an extract batch so I there see. was no now you could possibly get astringency from steeping grains if you're an extract brewer right if you're if you and all you have to do to avoid that is to not go too high in temperature you know and maybe squirt like just a touch of lemon juice or something in your water right just to make sure it stays acidified and you know not, not you wouldn't even taste just one squirt from like a one lead wedge of lemon, you wouldn't even notice, but it would acidify the water and keep that from happening. Got it. All right, so something to keep in mind, I yep. guess, but like only in those rare occasions where yep. your your temperature goes way too high and you're like, you're used, like it's just too much contact. Even time. as a batch sparger, when I do like an ordinary bitter, where you've only got maybe six pounds of grain and you're still trying to get an eight gallon pre-boil volume per se, if you're batch sparging that, you've got the potential to do, to pull tannins, but again, um, I've never, I've used, I used to brew a lot of ordinary bitter and I've never, I've never experienced this in my beer. All right. And well, that was before I was even doing water chemistry. So <laughs> if I was going to get it, I would have gotten it. <laughs> and you didn't. Didn't. So, and interesting. Thank you for sharing this off uh, flavor with me. I hope to never experience it <laughs> again. Um, but th so certainly better than putting in that uh, the ferrous oxide into the cheese. That was awful. <laughs> All right. So hopefully you like this video. You've learned from us to never, you know, Don't squeeze the bag. <laughs> Don't squeeze the bag of your specialty grains. And even if you did, you probably wouldn't get any kind of a yeah. in anyway. Um, uh, give us a thumbs up if you like this video. Subscribe to our channel because we do like to share all our fun knowledge about homebrewing. For John and Mike, brew-dudes.com. Brew on. Cheers.